An American writer. Um, he is in um, contact with people um, inside the Ermuk camp, uh, and he's a spokesperson for the Palestinian network of civil society in Syria, uh, Shamil. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me begin by thanking the organizers and everyone in attendance for joining us in what is, in my opinion, an ungodly hour. Uh, <laughs> so I want to begin, let me preface this by doing a quick survey of the room. Who here considers themselves a Palestinian solidarity activist, or at least has sympathies for Palestinian solidarity? All right. So most of the room. I'm going to begin by kind of cataloging some of the events that happened in Yarmouk from the beginning of the uprisings that lead us up until today with the ISIS invasion and where the camp currently is today and give a brief overview of some of the casualties, um, the Palestinian casualties of the Syrian uprising. Uh, given the time constraints, I'm going to have to be brief, but during the Q&A section or afterwards, feel free to approach me with any questions. So the story of Yarmouk in the context of the Syrian uprising is really a very complicated one. And because it is so complicated, people tend to hide behind that complexity. Um, it's interesting, and I'll speak about this more later, that a lot of the same excuses offered by people who don't want to get engaged politically with Syria are also the same used by people who don't want to engage in Palestinian solidarity work. And I want you to keep this in mind uh, in terms of the framework of everything that happened to Palestinians in Syria and our response as Palestinians or pro-Palestinian uh, activists or what have you in the West, in the diaspora. So during the beginning of the uprisings, Palestinian was within Yarmouk, which is the largest refugee camp in Syria, got together and there was a lot of kind of disagreement amongst people. Among the youth, there was a strong push towards getting actively involved in the revolution. Amongst some of the elders, there was a little more hesitation. There was a lot of awareness of the fact that in any context of war, Palestinians tend to find themselves at uh, the receiving end of some kind of brutality, whether in Lebanon, uh, Iraq, anywhere. Ultimately, a very loose consensus was reached that, at least officially, the camp would take a neutral stance towards the Syrian revolution. Again, this was prompted much more by considerations of uh, historic Palestinian um, suffering in context of war than it was by any uh, affinity towards the regime. On the contrary, uh, most people who I have interviewed who, who have escaped from Yarmouk and come to Europe, to Lebanon, to the States, seem to convey the same story, that there were huge affinities and sympathies amongst Palestinians, especially in Yarmouk, towards the revolution. But at first, it was at least partially muted. Now, this continued from the beginning of the uprisings up until May in 2011. During May 2011, I don't know if you guys remember, it, there was the commemoration of the Nakba, the great Palestinian dispossession. And on 2011, maybe you recall, a lot of states neighboring uh, Israel, historic Palestine, went down to the border and protested against Israel. And a lot of people actually got across the border and entered historic Palestine. Now, in Syria, it is almost impossible to get anywhere near the Israeli border, especially if you are a Palestinian. On this occasion, in the context of the uprising, the Syrian regime actually encouraged people to go down and protest and helped facilitate uh, you know, buses and what have you so that Palestinians could go down and protest. Well, they went down and protest, and the Israelis were generally unprepared, um, and so the casualties were relatively low. But already resentment began to emerge amongst people, amongst the Palestinian population towards the regime uh, to a stronger degree because of their inaction uh, after the Israelis had shot at Palestinians. Now fast forward to the summer of 2011. During the commemoration of the Nuxa Day, in the summer of 2011, the same thing happened. There were arrangements for protests at the Israeli border and Palestinians were encouraged to go down and protest, and they did, but this time the Israelis were much better prepared, and as a result, killed scores of Palestinians. It was exactly at this moment that the first public calls against the regime were made by Palestinians. 
واحد اثنين الجيش السوري وين؟ One two where is the Syrian army? Now this eventually turned into a protest within Yarmouk that led a huge mass of Palestinians inside the camp to the headquarters of the PFLP GC, a very important actor in all of this. Essentially, this is, uh, of course, not to be confused with the PFLP. It is a, a split-off group that is very marginal amongst Palestinian society, especially in Syria, and widely acknowledged as being nothing more than a proxy of the Assad regime. So they went to the headquarter and eventually burned down the building. The head of this particular faction had to be evacuated by the Syrian army uh, to escape from this, this large mass of Palestinians who most likely would have killed him. I point to this event for two reasons. This began the phase in Yarmouk where there were public calls for the fall of the regime, public protests against the regime by the Palestinian population. Also, in discourse surrounding Palestinians in Syria, sometimes amongst the left, amongst uh, the Arab left, the Western left, the PFLP GC is portrayed as being some kind of representation of the Palestinian people. I think the very fact that the leader of this group had to be evacuated by the Syrian army for fear of being murdered by the Palestinian population uh, quite easily does away with that absurd assertion. Now, from the summer of 2011 up until December of 2012, you had a period where Palestinians began to more publicly protest against the regime. During the same period, the Syrian regime began to arm the PFLP GC to crack down on protests against the regime inside of Yarmouk. You had mass arrests, uh, political prisoners who disappeared in Assad regime jails, uh, crack down on protesters. Basically, the camp was occupied by this group that amounts to no more than an Assad proxy group. December of 2012 is another important date. Now, on December 2012 is when the Syrian opposition first entered Yarmouk. They called it the gateway to Damascus. It is important to note that the exact day before any rebel force stepped foot inside Yarmouk, the Syrian regime dropped barrel bombs on it. Again, I point to this to highlight the fact that the catastrophe that is Yarmouk, the destruction of this very important camp, began before any rebel force stepped foot inside the camp. And it only speaks to logic that this repression was born out of the acknowledgement by the regime that the Palestinian people largely sided with the revolution. And it's not really difficult to understand why. They lived in Syria just like ordinary Syrians. They faced the same political rep uh, repression, the same economic hardship. All the things that served as the impetus for the uprising were also experienced by the Palestinian population there. So in December of 2012, the opposition enters the camp. This begins the second phase of Yarmouk. Now, initially, the factions that entered the camp were on the more so-called moderate side. And I say so-called because, again, I don't like the term moderate. Um, but were more secular in nature. I think it's important to acknowledge that elements of these oppositional forces uh, harassed the local population, were amounted to no, especially two brigades especially, uh, amounted to no more really than marooning thugs who harassed the Palestinians and uh, robbed the hospital inside of Yarmouk. But it is also important to note that these two brigades were kicked out not by the regime but by other oppositional factions within the camp. I point to this to highlight the fact to do away with the misconception that the opposition is one monolithic entity. It very much is not. Now, Yarmouk recently entered, uh, kind of grasped the attention of everyone in the West when ISIS entered uh, in April. It is, I think, important to note that before ISIS entered, Jabhat al-Nusra had a kind of brief reign over the camp where they also engaged in harassment of Palestinians, imposing their own fundamentalism. Now we can do all of this. We can acknowledge all of the crimes of the opposition, all of their shortcomings, uh, their harassment of the local population, without forfeiting what I think is the moral imperative, which is to acknowledge and to condemn the largest culprit of Palestinian suffering in Syria, the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Now, I want to go over some statistics quickly before offering my own commentary about what I think the implications of the destruction of Yarmouk is. Now, these are taken from the two 
Palestinian human rights group that are operating within Syria. Uh, the Palestinian League for Human Rights Syria and the Action Group for Palestinians in Syria, I specifically use Palestinian human rights group because the tendency is when you bring up, say, Amnesty International, your claims are immediately impugned and people say, well, this is a Western organization and it's all propaganda. No, all of this information comes from Palestinian Syrians who are documenting these atrocities on the ground. As of today, 2,875 documented Palestinian deaths have occurred in Syria since the uprising. I want you to think about that number. I mean, I, I took a survey earlier of people who have some sort of sympathy towards Palestinians and the Palestinian struggle. 2,875 Palestinians have been killed since the start of the uprisings. Now, what really bewilders me is the fact that this is something that is very rarely spoken about in pro-Palestinian circles, at least in the West. And that when it is acknowledged, it is acknowledged with with a preface of, well, okay, we, we feel terrible, there are all these Palestinian deaths, but what can we do? Both sides are terrible. Returning to an earlier point, I want to appeal to the discerning members of the audience. When we hear things like, oh, we don't want to talk about Syria, it's too divisive, or oh, both sides are to blame, or oh, well, yes, the regime is oppressive, but the only alternative is fundamentalists who are going to spread Islam. Where have we heard this before? Anyone active in any kind of SJP chapter who has been to any divestment meeting has heard this before. From the other side, we are essentially recycling Zionist talking points. For me, as a Palestinian, that is more than alarming, it is disgusting. The other thing you tend to hear is uh, this peddling of lesser of two evil politics. And I've heard it a lot from leftists in the West, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to say that anyone is free to peddle lesser of two evil politics, but they better damn well make sure that they have a Hillary Clinton bumper sticker come the next election cycle. <laughs> Finally, I, I kind of want to conclude by highlighting some of, of, well, before I conclude, let me just say that the overwhelming number of the deaths that I've uh, just given, the statistic I've just given, have been at the hands of the regime. Of this number, the largest cause of deaths is bombardment and shelling, almost entirely from the regime itself. The third largest cause of death of Palestinians inside Syria during the uprising, torture in Bashar al-Assad's regime prisons. 394 Palestinians have died of torture in Bashar al-Assad's prisons. The best way to die in prison, if you are a prisoner in one of Bashar al-Assad's prisons, dungeons, the best case scenario as conveyed to me by a Palestinian who was lucky enough to get out of jail in Syria, body sores. The final moments spent when you die of body sores are in a fevered delirium where you watch the meat literally fall off of your bone before death finally rescues you. You know, I've been, I've been writing about this and talking about this for, for three years now, and, and the, the point that tends to escape most people um, involved in Palestinian work, involved in pro-Palestinian work, is that the implications of this are much larger than the huge moral failure towards Syrians, towards the people inside Syria. They also, if, if you have no concern for Syrian life, for Syrian struggle for freedom, for dignity, if your only concern is Palestinians, this has huge implications for the Palestinian liberation movement. It is my view that, that the one thing that has permitted the endurance of Palestinians throughout all these years, with Palestinians cast in all corners of the world, is our sense of collectivity. Is the fact that a Palestinian who grows up in Texas still stands up and deeply, deeply feels the suffering of a Palestinian in Gaza is the fact that a Palestinian in the West Bank will recognize the suffering of Palestinians in Lebanon. This is what has allowed us to endure, and I'm afraid with the destruction of the Palestinian community in Syria, we have found in an almost unprecedented scale a disruption of this collectivity. And to our horror, we may one day come to find that we, by our own actions, by our own inactions, by our neglect of Palestinians in Syria, by our neglect and our, and our unwillingness to acknowledge the culprit of Palestinian suffering in Syria, 
may very well have signaled the final fragmentation of Palestinians. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.